Aloha. This is Edwin Boyer joining you from Honolulu, Hawaii. Wanted to do something a little bit lighter tonight. Wanted to do a little bit of um, story time. Something maybe that would be family friendly. I've read this book. I've read this book a decade ago, but barely can remember it. And I've I've recently one of my friends, a fellow, a comic book artist named Gary Shipman, wrote a comic book or created a graphic novel where a mouse is the hero. And so it reminded me of Red One. And so I thought I would change it up some tonight. And so instead of doing Dune or something, something super, super dark or super heavy, I thought I would do something that maybe would be a little bit lighter and maybe fa family friendly. <laughs> Before I get started, I'll say hello to the audience for a moment. Uh, I see I have uh, Draken. Good to see you. I see Mr. Jake. He says, tsunami warning sign. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a watch. I think we'll be all right. I'm relatively high, too. If there's a, if there's a tsunami tall enough to, to get me where I'm at in my building, it's kind of over for everybody. <laughs> all right. Is everybody comfy? Because that's the, that's the main point of this stream. Just a little comfy little story hour. Now, I do not add on the rights to any of this. I'm not going to monetize this. It's just a fun little story hour. If you want to read alone, you can go get yourself a Kindle copy at the same place I did. That's not an affiliate link or anything. I don't make any money off that. I just wanted to provide people with a direct link to it. All right. I'm not going to do a lot of analysis. I'm just going to read the story because it's been it's been forever since I've seen this myself. And so we'll see. We'll see what it holds for us. All right. I'm going to skip through the preface. Well, skip. There's a little opening poem. I'm going to skip past that, and we're going to get right into it. All right. So hopefully everybody is comfy, because here we go. It was the start of the summer of the late rose. Moss flower country shimmered gently in a peaceful haze, ba bathing deli delicately at each dew-laden dawn blossoming through high sunny noontides, languishing in each crimson-tinted twilight that heralded the soft darkness of June nights. Redwall stood four square along the marches of the Old South border, flanked on two sides by mossflower woods shaded depths. The other half of the abbey overlooked undulating sweeps of meadowland, its ancient gate facing the long dusty road on the western perimeter. From above, it resembled some fabulous dusky jewel, fallen between a green mantle of light silk and dark velvet. The first mice had built the abbey of red sun sandstone, quarried from pits many miles away in the northeast. The abbey building was covered across its soft face by that type of ivy known as Virginia creeper. The onset of autumn would turn the leaves into a cape of fiery hue, thus adding further glory to the name and legend of Redwall Abbey. I think I loaded up a map. I think I loaded up a map of Redwall. Yeah, yeah. So this is Mossflower Woods. Here is the road that they talked about. And the abbey itself. We may refer back to this. And is my audio okay? Hopefully you're not getting too much exterior noise. 
Oh, Bianca fights the zombies in the chat since he's read all of this. Fantastic. All right, let's dive back into the story. Let me know if the audio gets weird at all. Book one, The Wall. And I'm not sure about this pronunciation. I know they've done a series for this. I've always read it to myself as Matthias. Some people may read it as Matthias. I'm going to read it as Matthias. You guys let me know if that is disturbing. But until then, I will go with Matthias. Okay? Matthias cut a comic, a comical little figure as he wobbled his way along the cloisters with his large sandals flip-flopping and his tail peeping from beneath the baggy folds of an oversized novice's habit. He paused to gaze upward at the cloudless blue sky and tripped over the enormous sandals. Hazelnuts, hazelnuts scattered out upon the grass from the rush basket he was carrying. A rush basket is like a, a basket made out of reeds. Upon the grass from the rush basket he was carrying. Unable to stop, he went tumbling, cow over tail. Bump! The young, mice, the young mouse squeaked in dismay. He rubbed tenderly, he rubbed tenderly at his damp snub nose while slowly taking stock of where he had landed, directly at the feet of Abbot Mortimer. Immediately, Matthias scrambled about on all fours, hastily trying to stuff nuts back into the basket as he muttered clumsy apologies avoiding the stern gaze of his elder. Uh, sorry, Father Abbott. I tripped, you see. Trot on my own Abbott. Uh, Father Abbott. Oh, dear. I mean... <laughs> the Father Abbott blinked solemnly over the top of his glasses. Matthias again. What a young buffoon of a mouse. Only the other day he had singed old brother Methuselah's whiskers while lighting candles. The elder's stern expression softened. He watched the little novice rolling about on the grasp, grappling with large armfuls of the smooth hazelnuts, which constantly seemed to escape his grasp. Shaking his old gray head, yet trying to hide a smile, Abbot Mortimer bent and helped to gather up the fallen nuts. Oh, Matthias, Matthias, my son, he said wearily. When will you learn to take life a little slower, to walk with dignity and humility? How can you ever hope to be accepted as a mouse of Redwall when you are always dashing about, grinning from whisker to tail like a mad rabbit? Matthias tossed the last of the hazelnuts into the basket and stood awkwardly shuffling his large sandals in the grass. How could he say aloud what was in his heart? The abbot put his paw around the young mouse's shoulder, sensing his secret yearnings, for he had ruled Redwall wisely over a great number of years and gained much experience of mouse life. He smiled down at his young charge and spoke kindly to him. Come with me, Matthias. It's time we talked together. Get a sip of coffee here. And again, please let me know if, uh, if the audio gets <clears throat> banned at all. All right, here we go. I'm just going to back up just a paragraph here. The abbot put his paw around the young mouse's shoulder, sensing his secret yearnings, for he had ruled Redwall wisely over a great number of years and gained much experience of mouse life. He smiled down at his young charge and spoke kindly to him. 
Come with me, Matthias. It's time we talk together. <clears throat> a curious thrush, perching in a gnarled pear tree, watched the two figures make their way at a sedate pace in the direction of the great hole. One clad in the dark greeny brown of the order, the other garbed in the lighter green of a novice. They conversed earnestly in low tones. Thinking what a clever bird he was, the thrush swooped down on the basket that had been left behind. Twisters! The basket contained only hard nuts, locked tight within their shells. Feigning lack of interest, lest any other birds had been witness to his silly mistake, he began whistling jauntily a few bars of his melodious summer song, strolling nonchalantly over to the cloister wall in search of snails. It was cool inside Great Hall. Sunlight flooded down in slanting rainbow-hued shafts from the high, narrow stained glass windows. A million, a million colored, oh, here we go. A million colored dust motes danced and swirled as the two mice trod the ancient stone floor. The father abbot halted in front of the wall on which hung a long tapestry. This was the pride and joy of Redwall. The oldest part had been woven by the founders of the abbey, but each successive generation had added to it. Thus, the tapestry was not only a priceless treasure, it was also a magnificent chronicle of early Redwall history. The abbot studied the wonderment in Matthias's eyes as he asked him a question, the answer to which the wise mouse already knew. What are you looking at, my son? Matthias pointed to the figure woven into the tapestry. It was a heroic-looking mouse with a fearless smile on his handsome face. Clad in armor, he leaned casually on an impressive sword, while behind him, foxes, wildcats, and vermin fled in terror. The young mouse gazed in admiration. Oh, Father Abbot, he sighed, if only I could be like Martin the warrior. He was the bravest, most courageous mouse that ever lived. The abbot sat down slowly on the cool stone floor, resting his back against the wall. Listen to what I say, Matthias. You have been like a son to me. Ever since you first came to our gates as an orphan woodland mouse, begging to be taken in, come, sit by me, and I will try to explain to you what our order is all about. We are mice of peace. Oh, I know that Martin was a warrior mouse, but those were wild days when strength was needed. The strength of a champion such as Martin. He arrived here in the deep winter when the founders were under attack from many foxes, vermin, and a great wild cat. So fierce a fighter was, was Martin that he faced the enemy single pawed, driving them mercilessly far from mouse flower. During the rout, Martin fought a great battle against overwhelming odds. He emerged victorious after slaying the wildcat with his ancient sword, which became famous throughout the land. But in the last bloody combat, Martin was seriously wounded. He lay injured in the snow until the mice found him. They brought him back to the abbey and cared for his hurts until he regained his strength. Then something seemed to come over him. He was transformed by what could only be called a mouse miracle. Martin forsook the way of the warrior 
and hung up his sword. That was when our order found its true vocation. All the mice took a solemn vow never to harm another living creature unless it was an enemy that sought to harm our order by violence. They vowed to heal the sick, care for the injured, and give aid to the wretched and impoverished. So is it written, and so has it been through all the ages of mouse kind since. Today, we are a deeply honored and highly respected society. Anywhere we go, even far beyond mouse flyer, even far beyond mouse flower, we are treated with, with courtesy by all creatures. Even predators will not harm a mouse who wears the habit of our order. They know he or she is one who will heal and give aid. It is an unwritten law that red wall mice can go anywhere, through any territory, and pass unharmed. At all times, we must live up to this. It is our way, our very life. As the abbot spoke, so his voice increased in volume and solemnity. Matthias sat under his stern gaze, completely humbled. Abbot Mortimer stood and put a wrinkled old paw lightly on the small head, right between the velvety ears, now drooping with shame. Once more, the abbot's heart softened towards the little mouse. Poor Matthias, alas for your ambitions. The day of the warrior is gone, my son. We live in peaceful times, thank heavens. And you need only think of obeying me, your abbot, and doing as you are bidden. In time to come, when I am long gone to my rest, you will think back to this day and bless my memory, for then you will be a true member of Redwall. Come now, my young friend, cheer up. It is the summer of the late rose. There are many, many days of warm sun ahead of us. Go back and get your basket of hazelnuts. Tonight we have a great feast to celebrate. My golden jubilee as abbot. When you've taken the nuts to the kitchen, I have a special task for you. Yes, indeed. I'll need some fine fish for the table. Get your rod and line. Tell Brother Alf that he is to take you fishing in the small boat. That's what young mice like doing, isn't it? Who knows? You may land a fine trout or some sticklebacks. Run along now, young one. Happiness filled Matthias from tail to whiskers as he bobbed a quick bow to his superior and shuffled off. Smiling benignly, the abbot watched him go. Little rascal, he must have a word with the almoner to see if some sandals could be found that were the right fit for Matthias. Small wonder the poor mouse kept tripping up. <laughs> right. Wait, this is chapter two. How are we doing? Everybody following along? So we've got we've got the abbot and we've got Matthias. And then we've been introduced to Martin the warrior in the tapestry. But we've been told the time of warriors is past. The high warm sun shone down on Clooney the scourge. Clooney was coming. He was big and tough, an evil rat with ragged fur and curved, jagged teeth. He wore a black eye patch. His eye had been torn out in battle with a pike. Clooney had lost an eye. The pike had lost its life. <laughs> 
Some said that Clooney was a Portuguese rat. Others said he came from the jungles far across the wild oceans. Nobody knew for sure. Clooney was a bilge rat, the biggest, most savage rodent that ever jumped from ship to shore. He was black with gray and pink scars all across his huge, sleek body. From the top of his wet nose, up past his green and yellow slitted eye, across both his mean tattered ears, down the length of his heavy vermin-ridden back to the enormous whip-like tail which earned him his title, Clooney the Scourge. Now he rode on the back of the hay wagon with his 500 followers, a mighty army of rats, sewer rats, tavern rats, water rats, dockside rats. Clooney's army, fearing yet following him. Red Tooth, his second in command, carried a long pole. This was Clooney's personal standard. The skull of a ferret was fixed at its top. Clooney had killed the ferret. He feared no living thing. Wild-eyed, with the terror of rat smell in its nostrils, the horse plunged ahead without any driver. Where the hay cart was taking him was of little concern to Clooney. Straight on the paddock horse galloped, past the milestone lodged in the earth at the roadstone. Heedless of the letters graven in the stone, Redwall Abbey, 15 miles. Clooney spat over the edge of the cart at two young rabbits playing in a field. Tasty little things. A pity the cart hadn't stopped yet, he thought. The high, warm sun shone down on Clooney the Scourge. Clooney was a god of war. Clooney was coming near. <laughs> All right. Clooney the Barbarian. Chapter 3. If you're just joining us, we're reading from Brian Jiggs, Redwall. This is book one. We're now into the third chapter. Just a little comfy little story time tonight. I wanted to do a story time that you could listen to with your family or listen to yourself. Something that might be a little, little bit lighter, but have some action too. Here we go. Chapter three. Beneath the great hall of Redwall, candles burned bright in their sconces. This was the cavern hole of the mice. What a night it was going to be. Between them, Matthias and Brother Alf had caught and landed a full-grown grayling. They had fought and played the big fish for nearly two hours, finally wading into the shadows and dragging it to the bank. It was nearly two pounds in weight, a tribute to Brother Alf's angling skills combined with the youth, youthful muscles of Matthias and their joint enthusiasm. Constance the badger had to be called. Gripping the fish in her strong jaws, she followed the two mice to the abbey kitchen and delivered the catch for them. Then she made her farewells. They would see her at the Jubilee Feast that evening, along with many other mossflower residents who had been invited to share the festivities. Brother Alf and Matthias stood proudly beside their catch amid the culinary hustle and bustle until they were noticed by Friar Hugo. Busy as he was, the enormously fat Hugo, who would have no other title but that of Friar, stopped what he was doing, wiping the perspiration from his brow with a dandelion that he held with his tail, he waddled about inspecting the fish. Hmm, nice shiny scales. Mmm, 
bright eyes, beautifully fresh. Friar Hugo smiled so joyfully that his face disappeared amid deep dimples. He shook Alf by the paw and clapped Matthias heartily on the back as he called out between chuckles, Bring the white gooseberry wine. Fetch me some rosemary, thyme, beech nuts, and honey. Quickly. And now, friends, now, he squeaked, waving the dandelion widely with his tail. I, Hugo, will create a grayling a la red wall, such as will melt in the mouth of mice. Fresh cream. I need lots of fresh cream. Bring some mint leaves, too. They had left Friar Hugo ranting on, delirious in his joy, as they both went off to bathe and clean up, combing whiskers, curling tail, shining noses, and the hundred and one other grooming task that Redwall mice always performed in preparation for an epic feast. The rafters of Cavern Hall rang to the excited buzz and laughter of the assembled creatures. Hedgehogs, moles, squirrels, woodland creatures, and mice of all kinds. Field mice, hedge mice, door mice, even a family of poor little church mice. Kindly helpers scurried about, making everybody welcome. Hello there, Mrs. Churchmouth. Sit the children down. I'll get them some raspberry cordial. Why, Mr. Bankville, so nice to see you. How's the back? Better now? Good. Here, try a drop of this peach and elderberry brandy. Matthias's young head was in a whirl. He could not remember being so happy in all his life. Winifred the otter nudged him. I say, Matthias... Where's this giant grayling that you and old Alf hooked? By the claw! I wish that I could land a beauty like that. Nearly a two-pounder, wasn't it? Matthias swelled with pride. Such praise! And from the champion fisher herself, an otter. <laughs> Tim and Tess, the twin church, my, the tw the twin church mouse babes, felt Matthias's strong arm muscles and giggled aloud in admiration. He helped to serve them two portions of apple and mint ice cream. Such nice little twins. Was it only three months ago that he had helped Sister Stephanie to get them over tail rickets? How they had grown. Abbot Mortimer sat in his carved willow chair, beaming thanks as one by one, the new arrivals laid their simple homemade gifts at his feet. An acorn cup from a squirrel, fishbone combs from the otters, mossy bark sandals made by the moles, and many more fine presents, too numerous to mention. The abbot shook his head in amazement. Even more guests were arriving. He beckoned Friar Hugo to his side. A whispered conference was held. Matthias could only hear snatches of the conversation. Don't worry, Father Abbott. There will be enough for all. How are the cellar stocks, Hugo? Enough to flood the Abbey Pond, Father. And nuts? We must not run short of nuts. You name them, we've got them even candied chestnuts and acorn crunch. We could feed the district for a year. Dairy produce? Oh, that. I've got a cheddar cheese that four badgers couldn't roll, plus ten other varieties. Good, good. Thank you, Hugo. Oh, we must thank Alf and young Matthias for that magnificent fish. What fine rank anglers they are. There's enough to keep the entire abbey going for a week. Excellent mice. Well done. Matthias blushed to his tail's end. The otters! The otters! 
a loud, jolly cry went up as three otters in clown costumes came bounding in. Such acrobatics. They tumbled, balanced, and gyrated, cavorting comically across the laden tabletops without upsetting as much as a single sultana. They ended up hanging from the rafters by a strand of ivy to wild applause. Ambrose Spite the Hedgehog did his party piece. He amazed everyone with his feats of ledger mane. Eggs were taken from a squirrel's ear. A young mouse's tail stood up and danced like a snake. The incredible vanishing shell trick was performed in front of a group of little harvest mice who kept squeaking. He's got it hidden in his prickles. But had he? Ambrose made a few materious passes and produced the shell straight out of his mouth, straight out of the mouth of an awestruck infant mouse. Was it magic? Of course it was. All activity ceased as the great Joseph Bell tolled out eight o'clock from the Abbey Belfry. Silently, all the creatures filed to their allotted places. They stood reverently behind the seats with heads lowered. Abbot Mortimer rose and solemnly spread his paws wide, encompassing the festive board. He said the grace, fur and whisker, tooth and claw, all who enter by our door, nuts and herbs, leaves and fruits, berries, tuber, plants and roots, silver fish whose life we take, only for a meal to make. This was followed by a loud and grateful amen. There was a mass clattering of chairs and scraping of forms as everyone was seated. Matthias found himself next to Tim and Tess on one pole and Cornflower Field Mouse on the other. Cornflower was a quiet young mouse, but undoubtedly very pretty. She had the longest eyelashes Matthias had ever seen, the brightest eyes, the softest fur, the whitest teeth. Matthias fumbled with a piece of celery and self-consciously turned to see if the twins were coping adequately. You never could tell with those baby church mice. Brother Alf re remarked that Friar Hugo had excelled himself as course after course was brought to the table. Tender freshwater shrimp garnished with cream and rose leaves, deviled barley pearls and acorn puree, apple and carrot chews, marinated cabbage stalk steeped in creamed white turnip with nutmeg. A chorus of oohs and ahs greeted the arrival of six mice pushing a big trolley. It was the grayling. A grayling is a fish, if you're joining late. Reefs of aromatic steam drifted around Cavern Hole. The fish had been baked to perfection. Friar Hugo entered with a slight swagger, added to his ungainly waddle. He swept off his chef's cap with his tail and announced in a somewhat pompous squeak, my lord abbot, honored guest from Mossflower area and members of the abbey, Ahem. I wish to present my piece de resistance. Oh, get on with it, Hugo. <laughs> After some icy staring about to detect the culprit and several smothered sniggers, from around the room, the little frat friar puffed himself up once more and declaimed furly, Grayling a la Red Wall! <laughs> Polite but eager applause rippled around as Hugo sliced the fish and placed the first steaming portion onto a platter. 
with suitable dignity, he presented it to the abbot, who thanked him graciously. All eyes were on the father abbot. He took a dainty fork loaded precariously with steaming fish. Carefully, he transferred it from plate to mouth. Chewing delicately, he turned his eyes upward and closed them. Whiskers a twitch, jaws working steadily, munching away. His tail curled up, holding a napkin which neatly wiped his mouth. The abbot's eyes reopened. He beamed like the sun on midsummer morn. Quite wonderful, perfectly exquisite. Friar Hugo, you are truly my champion chef. Please serve our guest your masterwork. Any further speech was drowned out by hearty cheers. Right, that is the end of chapter three. This is probably a good place to stop. Let me know. Let me know if you want me to go one more chapter. I'll let you guys decide. If you want one more chapter, I can do another chapter. Otherwise, we will leave it off now. This is Brian Jakes Redwall. One more chapter. Was that a yes to continue or yes to stop here? Okay. All right. We'll do one more chapter. <laughs> chapter four. Clooney was in a foul temper. He snarled viciously. <laughs> The horse had stopped from sheer exhaustion. He hadn't wanted that. Some inner devil persuaded him that he had not yet reached his destination. Clooney's one eye slitted evilly. From the depths of the haycart, the rodents of the warlord's army watched their master. They knew him well enough to stay clear of him in his present mood. He was violent unpredictable. Skull face, Clooney snapped. There was a rustle in the hay. A villainous head popped up. Aye, chief, you want me. Clooney's powerful tail shot out and dragged the unfortunate forward. Skull face cringed, his sharp, dirty claws dung into his fur. Clooney nodded at the horse. Jump on that thing's back sharpish. Give it a good bite. Then I'll get the lazy brute moving again. Skullface <laughs> swallowed nervously and licked his dry lips. But chief, it might bite me back. Swish. Crack. Clooney wielded his mighty tail as if it were a bullwhip. His victim screamed aloud with pain as the scourge lashed his thin, bony back. Mutiny! Insubordination! Clooney roared. By the teeth of hell, I'll flay you into mangy doll rags. <laughs> mangy doll rags. <coughs> The skull face scurried over to the driver's seat, seat, yelling with pain. No more! Don't whip me, chief! Look, I'm gonna do it! Hold tight to the rigging back there, Clooney shouted to his horde. Skull face performed a frantic leap. He landed on the horse's back. The terrified animal did not wait for the rat to bite. As soon as it felt the loathsome, scratching weight descend on its exposed haunches, it gave a loud panic whinny and bucked. Spurred on by the energy of fright, it careered off like a runaway juggernaut. Skullface had time for just one agonized scream before he fell. The iron-shod cart walls 
cartwheels rolled over him. He lay in a red mist of death, the life ebbing from his broken body. The last thing he saw before darkness claimed him was the sneering visage, the sneering visage of Clooney the Scourge, roaring from the jolted backboard. Tell the devil Clooney sent you, Skullface. <laughs> they were on the move again. Clooney was getting near. All right. <laughs> that was a short chapter. Do you want one more? That was that was kind of a short chapter. Do you want me to continue on with chapter five? Let me know. It's kind of been alternating between the uh, the Redwall Abbey and the approach of Clooney the Scourge. Down in Cavern Hole, the great feast had slackened off. So had a lot of belts. Redwall mice and their guest sat back replete. There was still great quantities of food uneaten. Abbot Mortimer whispered in Friar Hugo's ear, Friar, I want you to pack up a large sack with food, hazelnuts, cheese, bread, cakes, and anything you see fit. Give it to Mrs. Churchmouse as secretly as you can without attracting attention. Poverty is an ugly specter when a mouse wife has as many mouths to feed as she does. Oh, and be sure that her husband doesn't suspect what you are doing. John Churchmouse may be poor, but he is also proud. I fear he might not accept charitable gifts. Hugo nodded knowingly and waddled off to do his abbot's bidding. Cornflower and Matthias. Now, Cornflower was the, is the pretty little mouse that Matthias, and Matthias is like a, a novice in the, uh, in the Redwall Abbey. You get the sensation that Matthias is a little sweet on Cornflower. Here we go. Cornflower and Matthias had become quite friendly. They were young mice of the same age. Though their temperaments were different, they found something in common, an interest in Tim and Tess, the twin church mice. They had passed a pleasant evening, joking and playing games with the little creatures. Tess had clambered onto Matthias's lap and fallen asleep, whereby baby Tim did likewise in the velvety fur of cornflower. She smiled at Matthias as she stroked Tim's small head. I bless their little paws. Don't they look peef don't they look peaceful? Matthias nodded contentedly in agreement. Colin Vole, <laughs> Colin Vole, twittered aloud and remarked rather foolishly, Ooh, would you look at Matthias and Cornflower there, and nursing those two, those two babbies like they was an old wedded couple. Well, crumble my bank. <laughs> I don't know what a vole sounds like. <laughs> Colin Vole twittered aloud and remarked rather foolishly, Ooh, would you look at Matthias and Cornflower there. And nursing those two babbies like there was an old wedded couple. What we'll crumble my bank? Brother Alf reprimanded him shortly. Here now, you keep a latch on that silly tongue of yours, Colin Vole. Don't you know that someday Matthias will be a red wall mouse? And don't let me hear you slandering young Cornflower. She's a decent mouse from a good family. Mark my words, Master Vole. I could say a thing or two to your mum and dad. Only last evening I saw you play and catch the bulrush with that young harvest mouse. What was her name now? Colin Vole blushed until his nose went dry. He flounced off, swishing his tail, 
muttering about going outside to take the air. Matthias caught a nod and a glance from the abbot. Excusing himself to Cornflower, he deposited the sleeping Tess gently upon his chair and went across to him. Ah, oh, Matthias, my son, here you are. Did you enjoy my jubilee feast? Yes, thank you, Father, Matthias replied. Good, good, chuckled the abbot. Now, I was going to ask Brother Al for Edmund to go on a special errand, but they are no longer young mouse. They are no longer young mice, and both look quite weary at this late hour. So I thought I might ask my chief grayling catcher to carry out this special task for me. Say the word, and I am your mouse, sir. The abbot leaned forward and spoke confidentially. Do you see the church mouse family? Well, it's such a long way back home for them on foot. Good heavens, and there are so many of them. I thought it would be a splendid idea if you were to drive them home in the abbey cart, along with any others going that way. Constant Badger would pull the cart, of course, while you could act as guide and bodyguard. Take a good staff with you, Matthias. The young mouse needed no second bidding. Drawing himself up to his full height, he saluted in a smart military fashion. Leave it to me, Father Abbott. Old Constance is a bit slow thinking. I'll take complete responsibility. The abbot shook with silent laughter as he watched Matthias march off with a soldier-like swagger. Flip, flop, flip, flop. He tripped and fell flat on his tail. Oh, dear. I'll have to get that young mouth some sandals that aren't so big. The abbot said to himself for the second time that day. What a stroke of luck. Fancy Cornflower's family living so close to the church mouse brood. Matthias was only too glad to offer them a lift home. Would Miss Cornflower like to sit next to him? She most certainly would. Cornflower's parents sat inside the cart, her mom helping Mrs. Churchmouse with the little ones, while her dad chatted away with John Churchmouse as they shared a pipe of old bracken twist. Friar Hugo came out and dumped a bulky sack next to Mrs. Churchmouse. Abbott says to thank you for the loan of bowls and tablecloths, ma'am. The fat friar gave her a huge wink. All comfy back there, called Matthias. Right, off we go, Constance. The big badger trundled the cart away as they called their good nights. She nodded at Methuselah, the ancient gatekeeper mouse. As the cart rolled out onto the road, a sliver of golden moon looked down from a star-pierced summer night. Matthias gazed upwards, feeling as if he were slowly turning with the silent earth. Peace was all about him. The baby mice inside the cart whimpered fitfully in their small secret dreams. Constance ambled slowly along, as though she were out on a nighttime stroll, pulling no weight at all. The stout ash staff lay forgotten on the footboard. Cornflower dozed against Matthias's shoulder. She could hear the gentle lull of her father's voice and that of John Churchmouth, blending with the hum of nocturnal insects from the meadow and hedges on this balmy summer night. The summer of the late rose, Cornflower turned the words over in her mind, dreamily thinking of the old rambler that bloomed in the Abbey Gardens. Normally it was in full red flower by now, but this year for some unknown reason it had chosen to flower late. It was covered in dormant young rosebuds even now, well into June, a thing that happened only infrequently 
and usually heralded an extra long, hot summer. Old Methuselah could only remember three other such summers in his long lifetime. Accordingly, he had advised that it be marked on the calendar in the Abbey Chronicles as the Summer of the Late Rose. Cornflower's head sank lower in sleep. The old cart rolled on gently down the long, dusty road. They were now over halfway to the ruined church of St. Ninian, where John Churchmouse lived, as had his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather before him. Matthias had fallen into a deep slumber. Even Constance was unable to stop her eyelids drooping. She went slower and slower. It was as if the little cart and its occupants were caught in the magic spell of an enchanted summer night. Suddenly, and without warning, they were roused by the thunder of hooves. Nobody could determine which direction the sound was coming from. It seemed to feel the very air about them as it gathered momentum. The ground began trembling with the rumbling noise. Some six cents were in Constance to get off the road to a hiding place. The powerful badger gave a mighty heave. Her blunt calls churned the roadside soil as she propelled the cart through a gap in the hawthorn hedge down to the slope of the ditch where she dug her paws in, holding the cart still and secure, while John Churchmouth and Cornflower's father jumped out and wedged the wheels firmly with stones. Matthias gasped with shock as a giant horse galloped past, its mane steaming out, eyes rolling in panic. It was towing a hay cart, which bounced widely from side to side. Matthias could see rats among the hay. But these were no ordinary rats. They were huge, ragged rodents, bigger than any he had ever seen. Their heavy, tattooed arms waved a variety of weapons. Pikes, knives, spears, and long, rusty cutlasses. Standing boldly on the backboard of the hay cart was the biggest, fiercest, most evil-looking rat that had ever slunk out of a nightmare. In one claw, he grasped a long pole with a ferret's head spiked to it, while in the other was his thick, enormous tail, which he cracked whoosh, like a whip, laughing madly, <laughs> and yelling strange curses. He swayed to and fro skillfully as horse and waggard clattered off down the road into the night. And suddenly, as they had come, they were gone. Matthias walked out into the road, staff in hand. Stray wisp of hay drifted down behind him. His legs trembled uncontrollably. Constance hauled the abbey cart back onto the road. Cornflower was helping her mother and Mrs. Churchill, Church Mouse, to calm the little one's tears of fright. Together they stood in the cart tracks amid the, the settling dust. Did you see that? I saw it, but I don't believe it. What in heaven was it? What in hell more like? All those rats, such big ones too. Aye, and that one on the back, he looked like the devil himself. Seeing Matthias still stunned by what had happened, Constance took over the leadership. She wheeled the cart around. I think we best head back for the abbey, she said firmly. Father Abbott will want to know this straight away. 
knowing that the badger was far more experienced than himself, Matthias assumed the role of second in command. Right, Cornflower. Get in the cart and take charge of the mothers and babies, he said. Mr. Fieldmouse, Mr. Churchmice, up front with Constance, please. Silently, the mice did as ordered. The cart moved off, with Matthias positioned on the back, providing a rear guard. The young mouse gripped his staff tightly, his back to his charges, facing down the the road in the direction the hay cart had taken. All right, now this is a good place to stop. This will bring us to chapter six, so this kind of this kind of ends us in chapter six. All right, so we are we're ending ending at chapter five, rather ending at chapter five. All right. If you would like for me to continue this later this week, maybe on Thursday, let me know down in the comments below, and I'll keep going with this. I I, I thought it might be something. I thought it might be something fun. To break it off, I know a lot of people. I know a lot of people are stuck at home, and I wanted to do something. I wanted to do something that people could listen to with their family. But I remember Redwall kind of being an interesting book. So yeah, but if if you would like me to go along with this story, uh, more than happy to do so. Not tonight, but in general, maybe we'll pick it up Thursday night. Let me do. Let me know down in the comments. But, but thank you for joining along. Let me see. Let me go to the table of contents real quick. So this is the, the first book. And we got through five chapters. So we would pick up in chapter six. I'm trying to get to the table of contents and see how many chapters we've got. Okay. Book one of this story has 20 chapters. Okay. So we made it about a third of the way through. So I'll probably try and go for about an hour at a time each time. Uh, We've been going for about 56 minutes now, but it seemed like a nice place to end it. And then each time we'll try and stop at a decent place. (laughs) Uh, I need to sit down and eat dinner with uh, my wife. If I'm feeling up to it, I may come back tonight. Otherwise, if you guys do want me to continue, I will pick it up on Thursday night. Anyway, this has been Red Wall. Uh, by uh, Ryan Jakes. If you want to buy a Kindle copy and follow along with me, I've put a link in the description to the video. I don't get anything from it. It's just if you want to follow along, you absolutely can. Not required though. And this video will not be monetized. Just doing it for fun. Anyway, we'll see you soon. Thank you for spending part of your Tuesday evening with me. Aloha and God bless.